Uh, dear folks, this evening um, we have good harvest this year, and certainly uh, all the crops seem to be gathered in. But there was one harvest I remember a few years ago. It was very bad harvest, very poor harvest, and a lot of crop was lost. The the uh, the uh, acres and acres of uh, crop was lying in the field over the winter, rotted away, and uh, I remember we were. Uh, singing a harvest hymn, uh, all is safely gathered in, uh, and we decided we'd change the uh, hymn, the wording, all will soon, hopefully, be gathered in, all will soon be gathered in. But dear friends, we're glad that there's a good bountiful harvest, crops are gathered in, God has been faithful, God has been good, Uh, the ground has produced, we have got far more of the blessings of God than we deserved. And friends, in the light of what I've said about the disappointing harvest, uh, we see here in the uh, reading of uh, Hosea chapter 10, uh, the prophet is speaking about a disappointing harvest uh, as far as his people Israel were concerned. They had turned away from the Lord. They had gotten away from God, the one who had blessed their lives, the one who had done so much for them. And we see, of course, here in Uh, Deuteronomy, as it tells us and warns in chapter 6, and there in verse 10, it tells us, and uh, he says, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him. And dear friends, it is so sad when indeed uh, those whom God has blessed has forgot to bless God. We have turned, many indeed have been blessed, as we say, these things that we see, these tangible things, things that are sitting around in the pulpit and out here in the front and on the windows, they're all there for one purpose, just to remind us of God's goodness, a remind us of his provision. They're just some of the tangible things that God has blessed our lives with. And we know that God has blessed us uh, daily. Our lives are loaded with blessings. Uh, as we were singing earlier on, uh, as uh, Johnny was uh, sharing with us the beginning in the worship, uh, count your many blessings, name them one by one. We have a, a wee uh, version in a listen to ski, it says, Count your many blessings, name them by the score, and it will surprise you there are millions more. For it's sheer sure, friends, God continues to bless us day and daily. We can never count the blessings of God, they are multiplied as the sand of the sea for number. And so, dear friends, we see God is expecting us to return fruit. We have here our scripture reading uh, that reminds us uh, that God is looking for something uh, in return, as we read through the uh, prophet uh, uh, Hosea this evening, 10th chapter. And it says... Indeed, very tragically, Israel is an empty vine. God looks upon his people who be blessed. Israel, of course, in the Old Testament, there were the chosen race. God chose to come through Israel, uh, bring uh, the, uh, the salvation of the world through Israel. He said to Abraham, right there in the beginning, uh, Genesis chapter 12, he said to Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing and through you the nations of the earth will be blessed. And of course God raised up the nation of Israel to send out the, God, the, 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 the wonderful news of a saviour the prophets prophesied of it and told of the great and glorious prospect of a saviour, a mighty saviour that was coming. And all the sacrifices that were made in the Old Testament, the blood sacrifices and all the offerings that were made to God were indeed offerings in thanksgiving for what God had promised and also the sacrifices 
were types and indeed uh, figures of that which is to come. The little lamb, of course, that was shed, uh, that blood was shed for the uh, freeing of the children of Israel in the night when the death angel passed over and they came out of their bondage uh, was a lamb. And, of course, they had to shed his blood and they had to sprinkle the, the doorpost and on the lentil of the door of the house. And that was pointing to the Savior. All the blood sacrifices were pointing to a coming sacrifice. The Lamb of God, as John the Baptist said when he saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. In the Old Testament, it was laying the foundation uh, for that day. They looked forward, and now we look back to Calvary. They looked forward to the great finished work. And, of course, we have a number of converted Catholic people in Listen to Ski. When I came to Listen to Ski, I was very conscious uh, that they, we were in a predominantly Catholic community. And I prayed, God, please give us favor with the Catholic people. Give us a, a, a ministry amongst these dear people. And we thank God that a number have come to Christ. Some of them are in leadership in the church. And we thank God for that. Uh, but sadly, tragically... Many are deceived by a false gospel and they continue to, to hold their masses, which of course only speaks about the fact that the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, the Son of God, was not sufficient. They continually, to continually sacrifice the offering, as it were, uh, the body of Christ as a sacrifice for sin, that he still is brought and laid on the altar at the Mass. And friends, it is a blasphemous uh, uh, doctrine that has deceived so many people because Christ made one offering for sin forever. And therefore, there is no more sacrifice to be made but that one offering for sin. And friends, it's wonderful tonight that we can look back to Calvary, look back to that place where Jesus bled and died for our sins, that we might go free and that we might be liberated and that we might be cleansed and purified and made righteous and made fit for his kingdom. And friends, a wonderful thing to know that Christ has done it. To know that Christ has accomplished. He, he cried out in that place when he was suffering great pain. And for he, his life was extinguished. He cried out, Telaleskia, which in the Greek is, it is a finished. He finished the work that he came to do. It's a great thing to know uh, that Jesus finished what needed to be done. The Old Testament, he said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. The Old Testament pointed to Calvary. And the Calvary, of course, indeed, is the finished work of God's provision for your salvation and mine. And friends, tonight, there is no one in this meeting that cannot be saved by looking to Calvary. There is no one tonight that has been saved that haven't looked to Calvary because the cross is the only place where we can find redemption and forgiveness and mercy. Some people are deceived by thinking that by their self-righteous deeds, by their church attendance, by their, the, the, uh, the, the institutions and the ordinances of the church that they can become good enough and acceptable to God. But friends, it's, it's certainly good uh, to live right and to do the best we can and to be as decent as we can in a society where there's awful wickedness and corruption today. But it's not sufficient to save the sinner. We need the cross because Jesus is the only a way of redemption. For without the shedding of his blood, there is no remission for sin, friends. And so we see... Here, Israel was blessed. They were given a great and a wonderful heritage. They have been blessed with all the, uh, the, the wonderful promises and uh, the great sacrifices that were made, that were made to, partake, to take care of their sin. And God brought them out of bondage and brought them into a wonderful land of promise and of provision. We touched on it. We were speaking on it this morning, the land of milk and honey. And God's... Provision is milk and honey. It is rich provision. 
And of course, we read from Ephesians also referred to and made reference to the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse uh, and also chapter 4 uh, where God speaks about the riches of his grace and the fullness of Christ in our lives. And that's what God, Jesus died for was that we might not only be saved but we might experience the richness of his grace and that we might indeed see the bounty of his provision. It's a terrible thing uh, to have blessings available to us that we don't partake of. If uh, someone was to sign a check and hand it to you, if it were for a million pounds, I heard of somebody winning 170, I think it was 170 million there recently on the lottery. Well, you see, friend, when they were handed that 170 million, as far as their salvation is concerned, it couldn't have done that for them. For the shed, if without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But if someone was to hand you a check of that amount and you didn't cash it, then you'd still be financially poor. It would be no good to you. And friends, we have an offering that was made on the cross for our salvation. And unless we, as it were, uh, speaking with and due reverence, unless we cash in on what Jesus has done for us, we will still be lost. As lost as if he never had done it. And friends, this evening, the word of God calls Israel an empty vein. That's a very sad thing, for it says here in chapter 11, verse 1, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burnt incense to graven images. So God was saying, when Israel was a young nation, I called them out of bondage. I brought them into a land of liberty, a land of plenty, a land of provision. But they sacrificed unto Balaam and burnt incense to graven images. Sadly, that's what we're doing today, friends. Sacrificing on to Balaam. Our nations are sacrificing on to false gods. They're worshipping the God of self and the God of pleasure and the God of uh, wealth and the God of prosperity. And you see, friends, uh, whenever in, in Matthew chapter 19, the young man came to Jesus and the young man said to Jesus, Good master, what good thing can I do that I might inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Keep the commandments. He said, All this have I done from my youth up. And what lack I yet? He was sincere, wanting to know how he could have eternal life. I wouldn't doubt that. But the Lord Jesus said, Then, I know your problem lies. Go and sell your rich, all you have. You're very wealthy. Go and sell it and give it to the poor. <clears throat> And then come, follow me. And that's where a problem lay. He wanted the best of both worlds. He wanted to live for the pleasure, the treasures of this world, and he wanted to have eternal treasure. He wanted to have the best of both worlds. Friends, we have got to be willing to give up our desires to follow Christ. That may, for some, mean prosperity and blessing. For others may not. Dear friends, the prosperity gospel is a prosperity gospel out there today. And that's deceiving people and telling people, if you come to Christ, Christ will bless your life with uh, such blessings. You will be wealthy in uh, material riches. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus said riches will keep you out of heaven. He said to us, uh, have potential to keep you out of heaven. He said to the rich man, uh, to the rich young ruler, he said, he said of him, he said, how hardly shall a rich man enter into the kingdom of heaven. And friends, if we're depending on our own goodness, <clears throat> pardon me, if we're depending on our own goodness, we'll never get to heaven. If we're depending on our riches, we'll never get to heaven. If we're depending on anything else than the finished work, then we'll never attain our salvation. Israel is an empty vine. She was without God. It says in verse 1. 
a nation that had forgotten God, a nation that had been blessed of God, a nation that turned its back on God, a nation that forsook the Lord. They became a selfish vine. For it says in the verse 1 also, it says, that bringeth forth a fruit unto himself. That's what Israel became, a selfish vine. Now I said, look and see how many times you can see the vine in the, this reading. And it's made reference to on a number of occasions. The very word is not used, but it's made reference to. Israel is an empty vine. Israel is a selfish vine. What does sin do, friends? Sin makes us self-centered. We want, I want. We want what is not good for us so often. When we live without God, our desires are not pure desires. Our desires are not wholesome desires. We live for the things that will not last. In fact, dear ones, this evening, many people are trying these days to fill up their lives with some of these things because they're empty. They're the empty thine. They have no God in their lives. They have no desire for the ways of God. The doors are open here. The town is full of needy people. Valisali is full of needy people. And friends, it's because tonight Satan is the God of this world. He is seeking to keep people away from hearing truths whereby they might be saved and come to know Christ and find that liberty and joy and hope and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel, God's people, the people that ought to be blessed, are empty. God is not in them. God is not with them. And they become, then they turn to the things of this life and this world and the selfish things of time. What did the rich farmer do? He said, when his crop was good, he said, I'll build greater barns and pull down the ones I have. I'll build greater barns. All he was thinking of about him was himself. But God said, thou fool. You know why God called him a fool? It wasn't because he was building new barns. It wasn't because he had a great crop. It was because he had no thought for God. He was living, he was filling his life up with earthly things, with self-centered things, and he was building up his wee earthly kingdom. And at a moment, it was gone. For God said, you're a fool tonight, you're going to die. And that man died that night. A fool. Because he tried to fill his life up without God being reckoned on, without reckoning on the Lord. Selfish vine. The more or so often, the more God blesses his, uh, us, the more liable we are to forget God. It's a very sad thing. Indeed, for the word of God said, Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, the rich ruler, he was a divided vine. He was a, his heart was divided. He wanted both, both parts. Both, he wanted both ways. You cannot serve God and mom and Jesus said. You cannot have the best of both worlds. It's either Christ or the world. And if we're going to have to give up any, then give up the world, friend. Give up the sin. Give up the ways of darkness. Give the way of your own choosing and your own pleasure and your own self-centered desires. And have Christ, for he'll fill your life. You see, dear friends, a wonderful thing when you come to the Lord. Because he doesn't just take away from us, he adds to us. He fills our lives with good things. He fills our lives with his presence. He fills our lives with his peace. He fills our lives with assurance of eternal life in heaven. He fills us with great and a wonderful hope that will, this world cannot give and thank the Lord cannot take from us unless we allow the world to come in and indeed take away from what God has done for us. And dear friends, we see here a divided vine, not only a self, uh, an empty vine, a selfish uh, vine, but we see a divided uh, vine because it says in the, the verse 2, their heart, their heart is divided. Divided. You see, friends, tonight, there are so many that want to live like that. 
They want to live with a, a double motive in life. That's what James chapter 1 reminds us of. A double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. And let that man know that he will receive nothing of the Lord. And if you're going to come to Christ, friends, you've got to come with no strings attached. With your hands up as a sinner, come to Jesus and submit your life to him and surrender to his will for your life. Dear ones, this evening, it is so important that you recognize that our great need is the Lord Jesus and nothing else, him alone. That's the only time he can do anything for us. That's the only time he can set us free. That's the only time he can liberate us and put us on a, a new plane is when we're willing to give up all for him. There's a cross to be born. As I said this morning, it's not an easy road. But it is the best road. It is God's road. It is the heavenward road. Jesus said himself in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, he says, Enter in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Few there be that find it. We have to give up. We can't bring the world. We can't bring our sin. We can't live our own life and follow the Lord. We have got to turn away from it and then our road. We can't bring all the baggage with us and we give it to Jesus. We take it to the cross and we leave it at the foot of the cross. We say, Lord, uh, indeed, uh, I have baggage that I do not, that does not uh, do me good. And I leave it with you at Calvary. It's a baggage of sin. And for in many forms, indeed, it comes into our lives. So we see, indeed, we, the, the divided vine, the one best both of lives, want to live uh, for the world and want to live for God. And you know why God blesses our lives? You know why we have these lovely fruit? Why we have all the daily tangible things and provisions of life? Why there are crops in the fields? Why? Because it tells us in Romans chapter 2, and I think it's verse 4, it says, The goodness of the Lord... But the goodness of the Lord leadeth men to repentance. God wants to, us to see that he loves us. He cares for us. And therefore, as Jesus walked this scene of time, he cared for all. He made those sick well. He made the blind to see, the deaf to hear this. He made the, the leprous cleanse, the dumb to speak. He, he was showing that he cared for us. And of course, we see that the goodness of the Lord should lead us to come to him. And sadly for Israel, here in the Old Testament, as God, the more God blessed him, the more prodigal they became, the more separated from God they became. Matthew Henry said, it is an affront to God. Uh, the more uh, we receive uh, blessings, we receive mercies, we receive from him the more sins we commit against him. It is an affront to God, the more mercies we receive from him, the more sins we commit against him. And friends, that is so true in our society today. The more God has blessed us, we have so many blessings in life and the many common blessings of daily life. And indeed, sadly, because of that people have felt, well, we are, don't need God. When I'm out on doors, I'm very conscious that the people that are the hardest to get through to are the people in the more upper class areas. You go into the areas where there's uh, a little more down to earth people, they will quickly, more quickly recognize that they need Christ. But the upper class have got everything we have got all the money we've got a good bank balance we've got a good car a nice house we've got a good family and that's what more they want and dear friends sadly they just settle for that and until it comes to the crisis and things start to go wrong and they say why did God allow that to happen to me if God is a God of love well, why wouldn't he it was uh, Anne Graham, Dr. Billy Graham's daughter, 
who was interviewed as to the terrible uh, storm Katrina hurricane that was in America some time ago. And the interviewer asked her, why would God allow such a thing? If God is a God of love and he loves us, why would he allow that to happen? She said a, a very profound answer. I'm just giving you one or two wee bits of it, but she said this. She said, I'm sure God is grieved when he saw what was happening when Katrina storm hit America. But he said, she said, you threw him out of your schools. You threw him out of your government. You have threw him out of your courts. And you have thrown him out of your lives. And yet you expect God to look after you. You see, dear friends, when God blesses us, as he has done the nation of America, as he has done the nation of uh, uh, this nation, Brit Britain, as he has done, and then something goes wrong, and it's like, point the finger at God. But the three fingers are pointing back at us. We have forgotten God. And sadly, sadly, many people... Because they have been blessed of God and God has been good to them. And indeed their affluence and their wealth and their business, their ungodly acquaintance and desires and pleasures of this world and so on have drawn them away, taken them away from God. We have money to spend on this, money to spend on that. We don't need God. We have all we need. See, dear friends, you never find true peace without God. Because your life is meant for fellowship with God. God made us. He brought us into this world so that we might live for him. And we might enjoy him. What is the first question in the shorter catechism? What is the chief end of man? And the answer is the chief end of man is that we might glorify and enjoy him forever. That's what the chief end of life is. When we miss that, friends, we miss the purpose of life. If you're here tonight and you miss and you haven't the Lord in your life, you've missed the reason, the purpose, the chief purpose for life. And that's why your life is empty. And that's why your life is barren. Friends, because indeed there's something missing that's vital. And God made us for Himself. We see indeed. Not only the empty vine and the selfish vine and the divided vine, but we see indeed a forsaken vine. It says in verse 3, We have no a king. We have no king. You see, dear friends, when we forsake God, we have no king. The governments of this world have failed us and have failed their people. We look to our present day situation in this nation and all we can say it is our governments have utterly failed us. We have no king today in our nation. We have no righteous rulers today. We have no one that we can look to today. And of course, it tells us in the book of Judges, in the last chapter, I think it's the very last verse, it says there uh, that indeed in uh, those days there was no king in Israel and the people did that which was pleasing in their own eyes. And friends, the king is gone out of our lives. King Jesus is gone out of life. Then, you see, that in, in Psalm 14 it says, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. You know why he says there is no God? Because he doesn't want to be accountable to God. He wants to bury his head in the sand. He doesn't want to believe that there is one day when he will have to stand before God. And he says there is no God. Let's live the way we want. Let's, let, let's do the things we want. There is no king. So let us, let us have a good time. Let us live it to the full. Let us throw all, all restraints off. Let us go for it. And therefore, what do they suffer? They suffer the consequences 
the consequences of sin, the wages of sin is death, physical and spiritual. And friends, we do know indeed when there is, we forsake God, then we are a blind people. We have no leader. We have no guide. We grope our way through life. And we surely are like the two blind men that came to the side of the, the highway. And of course, the one thought the other could take them across. They didn't realize the other person was blind. It is a case of the blind was leading the blind. And they took each other's hand. And hoping that, and believing that one knew the way across, and they all both walked across together, blind to the danger of an oncoming bus, and it hit them and killed both of them, the story goes, because they were walking without a guide, because they had no guide, they had no saviour, there was no one that could take them safely across, and dear friends, every one of us here are going to have to cross Jordan. The River Jordan speaks about death and speaks about crossing over to the other side. And if we haven't Jesus, then we will indeed be groping our way in the hour when we most need him. That's why we love that 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. You see, friends, that's what makes the difference. When God is with us, when God is with us in our business, we can pray about everything. We can ask him to guide us, to keep, uh, to help us to make the right decisions. When God is with us in our homes, in our families, with our children, as we bring up our children, we can pray for them. We can pray God will help us, give us grace and wisdom as we bring up our families. God is with us in our, our, our workplace. Then we can pray that God will use us and bless us there and help us to be a blessing in the workplace. In college or wherever we go, we can have God with us to guide us. And friends, tonight isn't it great to know that he is a perfect guide. He will not, if we forsake our king, then we'll be like those blind men that walked out in the road without a guide and both suffered the consequences. It tells us in the fourth verse, it says, Thus judgment springeth up as in hemlock and the furrows of the field. Hemlock is a poisonous plant. And friends, as we live without God, it'll be like Elisha when he sent his servants to gather up some herbs to make a pottage for them to eat. And one of them, when they tasted, one of the sons of the prophets said, there's master, there's poison in the pot. You see, the devil makes it seem sweet. It makes, he makes it look palatable. But whenever we taste it and we get the, the, and the outcome, we will see there's poison in the pot. Sin always poisons the pot, whatever Satan offers us. And know this, dear friends that God has made full provision for us. Not just in fruit and in vegetables and in the nice things and the tangible things that we can see, but dear friends, for our soul, God has made full provision for us that every one of us might have that life of God. It says in verse 12, as we conclude, it says, So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your hard ground, your fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord. There needs to be a new sowing so that there will be a new reaping. Sow to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. God wants your soul tonight to be saved. The word of God is the true seed of God. It is the certified seed that will bring forth fruit of righteousness. And I remember when we were 30 years in the farm before we went into uh, ministry and I learned a lot of, of uh, what, what goes on when you're going to sow seed, or whether it be grass seed or whether it be cereal or whatever, we, we had to get certified seed, seed that was going to produce proper results when you put it in the ground. 
and it was more expensive, all right, than the ordinary. If you took your own seed that you had that you had harvested the previous year, you probably would have about 50% less uh, uh, fertility from it. And dear friends, the seed of God's word is very sure. It is truth that cannot be mistaken. It is truth that will not fail. It will grow, bring forth fruit in your heart. Many have watered down the seed of truth. You can go to churches today where the truth is so watered down. I've listened to it even today in the radio. So watered down that it's no use, no use. It doesn't do anything for anyone. People like to hear something that is pleasant and pleasing to the ear. But it's not certified seed. It will not produce righteousness. But the truth produces righteousness if you will receive the truth into your heart. Breaking up the fallow ground is a painful procedure. It calls for repentance. Repentance, uh, repent and repentance is named about 70 times in the scriptures. It's a very key doctrine. And without repentance, there is no forgiveness. That simply means that we have got to, we have got to acknowledge our sin. We have got to acknowledge our sinfulness. And we have got to come truly repentant to the sinner saviour dear friends it's a painful work breaking up the ground for the uh, harvest to be sown it's a painful work for the farmer going out there and uh, the plowing to be done in the cold weather breaking up the ground a lot of hard work but friends repentance then brings the ground to the place where God's truth will get in and will produce salvation in our soul when we receive it through repentance and faith towards God. And then there'll be a bountiful harvest. What does it say? Break up the fallow ground. It's time to, to, it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. God wants you. He wants every one of us to be a righteous people. He wants us to be right with God. That's simply what it means, to be right with God and to be ready for Jesus is coming, friends. Be not, do not be mistaken. He is coming soon. I believe that within a very short space of time, the day of the Lord will come. According to the pace of things that are being prophetic scriptures that have been fulfilled the, the midnight hour the, the, the hands of the, the, the prophetic clock are almost at the midnight hour and friends we're going to see maybe in our lives we're going to see the coming of the Lord Jesus will burst the clouds he'll take his own and he'll leave the chaff the chaff for those that have not accepted Christ and God's word says they shall be burned with unquenchable fire. The consequences, there is two alternatives. Repent and seek God and find mercy and produce righteousness or sin on and live on without Christ and one day suffer the eternal consequences of a soul that is forever lost. I was speaking to my son just recently last week during the week he loves the Lord dearly he said you know dad God has given me some glimpses of what hell must be like for the lost and friend Sammy Workman the late Sammy Workman a mighty evangelist throughout this land and hundreds of souls to Christ he said I wouldn't wish hell on my worst enemy because just read the book tonight what it says about that place we want to flee from the wrath to come because it's a reality as heaven is a reality hell is a reality the one road takes us in the one direction what road are you on and the other road takes us in the other direction one to life the other to death what road are you on tonight what road are you taking tonight don't be mistaken Whatsoever we sow, we reap. 
May God bless us, Trace, your heart. Let's pray. Lord, tonight we're